You know, aviation is one of the safest forms of travel in the world. In fact, for every 4.2 million flights flown, there's only one fatal accident. It's pretty amazing. And when we look at the general aviation industry, there's, it's incredibly safe as well. In fact, we have some unique challenges, though, we have to consider. Some of those challenges involve the fact that our pilots aren't necessarily airline pilots, and they don't necessarily fly every single day on a regular basis, and very often their aircraft are single pilot flown. I want you to imagine that you've been on vacation for the past couple weeks, but it's time to head home. So you head out to the local airport where your aircraft is waiting for you. You load up your bags and your most precious cargo, your family. You taxi out, you climb up to 23,000 feet, and you settle in for roughly a two and a half hour flight. Everybody's happy. Children are in the back having a good time. And you're focused on managing the aircraft. You've done this flight many times, and it's a beautiful day for flying. Blue skies and tailwinds. So as you're flying along on your two and a half hour flight, after a little bit of time, you start to notice that you've got a bit of a headache. You're becoming a little unclear, a little confused, face is a little flushed. You start to get concerned. You turn around and look at your family behind you, and you notice they've all nodded off, which is a little unusual. They were just playing cards a few minutes ago. So like most pilots, you turn your attention to the avionics panel, and you start to troubleshoot, making sure that everything's OK. So you reach down to the avionics panel pulse oximeter, and you check your oxygen levels. Normal is between 90 and 100, and you're usually about 95. So imagine your surprise when the reading comes back at 79. It's a little low. So immediately, you start to plan your course of action. You probably should descend to a lower altitude. So you reach out to air traffic control, but to your luck, the airspace looks a little bit like this today. It's pretty busy. So you might be waiting just a little bit while ATC comes up with a path forward for you. So while you're waiting, you lose consciousness, along with the rest of your family. Your aircraft's on autopilot, so it continues at 23,000 feet on your current heading, at your current altitude, at your current airspeed. So I'm going to leave you there at 23,000 feet. Don't anyone have an anxiety attack? You'll be OK. But I'm going to leave you there for a few minutes, and I promise I'll come back to you. It's been about 120 years since Orville and Wilbur Wright pioneered aviation with the first powered flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And while 120 years sounds like a long period of time, in reality, it really isn't all that long. When you consider that we went from this, the Wright Flyer, to today, the Boeing 787, which is one of the most advanced commercial aircraft flying today. And then here, the M600, a general aviation aircraft, incredibly advanced. But that 120 years, a lot changed, right? We, went, we changed avionics, we changed engines, airframe, aerodynamics advanced, and we changed the materials that we used to build aircraft. All of those advancing technology and the way we design and build our aircraft today. But when we think about avionics, let's put that in perspective. In 1937, this was a Piper Cub. It's pretty simple. Airspeed indicator, altimeter, oil pressure gauge, compass, pretty simple. But then again, the aircraft were pretty simple. And about in 2000, we launched this system. We thought this was the most advanced thing that could be put in an aircraft. But only 14 years later, we started installing a system like this, called the G3000. So it's important to note that the dawn of the computer age has been an amazing catapult for technology and really helped advance and enable the advancements in avionics. And in fact, the advancements in avionics that we're seeing are some of the key enablers in a lot of the safety features that are coming to the market. So we're going to talk about those safety features, but before we do, I want you to realize that sometimes safety features that are installed in an aircraft are dictated by third parties, like our friends at the FAA, and other times they're self-imposed by an aircraft manufacturer that has their owner's best interest at heart. So let's start with one of those third-party imposed uh, advancements, ADSB, 
automatic dependent surveillance. Now the good news is there won't be a test after this, so you're not gonna have to know what this means, but this does involve every single person in this room that uses air travel in any way, shape, or form. ADSB is an FAA mandate. So the government went out and told everybody who owns an aircraft, regardless of size or age, you must equip your aircraft with specific avionics by January 1st of 2020. Well, my goodness, that's less than 90 days away. But the great news is we've had time to get all this technology put in the aircraft. It's the backbone of what we call next gen, which is the next generation of air traffic control. You see, if you travel, you'll know what I'm talking about. The airspace has become incredibly saturated. And very often, if you're flying, there's, I'm sure there's been instances where you've had a delay, but yet the weather was beautiful, and you couldn't piece it together in your mind why there was even a delay to begin with. Well, sometimes it's because the airspace is simply too saturated, and air traffic control has to manage that. This system now provides real-time data to air traffic controllers so they know where everybody is, virtually real-time. This then makes the airspace a lot safer, it's much more efficient to manage, and it's also environmentally friendly. So I bet you're sitting there right now wondering, well, wait a minute. You mean that this tells air traffic control exactly where the planes are? Didn't they already know that? <laughs> well, they did. <laughs> they used ground-based radar initially. But the issue with ground-based radar is there's a lag. There's a delay in the data. So while air traffic control could see the airplanes, it was a little bit dated. or There was some time had passed since the data had uploaded. So this new system uses the GNSS constellations. Basically, that's the umbrella for GPS. So aircraft with the equipment basically get their position from the GPS system, and then that information is then communicated to air traffic control. What's important is this updates 12 times more frequently than ground-based radar, giving air traffic control virtually real-time data. What's also interesting is that because the system's nearly exact, Air traffic and control can now clear airplanes on a consistent approach and constant approach into an airport as opposed to a stepped approach. What that means is that aircraft now burn less fuel, which means they lower their carbon footprint. Additionally, air traffic control can better manage where everybody is in space and time now that they have real-time data. So this is really a win-win for everybody, reduces delays, which makes everyone in this room happy, and it's incredibly safe. But well, when we talk about those systems that manufacturers determine need to be installed in their aircraft based on their customers and how they fly their airplanes, ESP is one of the first ones that comes to my mind. It stands for Enhanced Stability and Protection. It's an incredibly powerful system that basically provides oversight of the aircraft's flight conditions and lends a helping hand if ever needed. So let me back up just two steps and let you know that the NTSB monitors offline that takes place. And they track the causes of accidents. And on their most wanted list is loss of control. This system helps address loss of control. So here's how it works. So you're flying along, you don't have the autopilot on, and you start to maybe get in a cloud, and you become a little disoriented. And the aircraft starts to bank over a little bit. You're unaware of this situation. But you start to feel a little bit of a positive correcting force in the controls. That's a signal to you that you perhaps should level the wings or pay better attention to the flying stability of the aircraft. Well, let's say you ignore this and you continue to bank the aircraft over even further. Well, a stronger correcting force will then come into play and encouraging you to level the wings. If you ignore this correcting force, it will engage the autopilot within two minutes It'll level the wings, hold your altitude, and hold your airspeed, which buys you critical time to regain situational awareness of your aircraft and regain control of your flight. Well, what if you pitch the aircraft up too far? Same system engages, avoiding what we would call underspeed protection, which could put you in a stall. Or if you, nose the, if you push the nose over at too steep an angle, it'll encourage you to pull the nose up. This way you avoid overspeeding the aircraft or flying at a speed that is beyond the structural limitations. So it's incredibly um, helpful because it provides this oversight and keeps you safe. But what if you're aware that you have a problem? Because you know, the system we just talked about is passive, so it's just monitoring you. What if you're flying along and you become a little bit confused? 
Well, we have a system called LVL, automatic level mode. We also call it the blue button at, at my company. So you're, you're flying along, it's a busy day, a lot going on, the weather's building, you need to land soon, and you just become a little overwhelmed. Well, no problem. The aircraft's equipped with this blue button that I mentioned. All you need to do is push that button, it'll level the wings, hold your airspeed, hold your altitude. Again, buying you that critical time to regain situational awareness, avoiding a loss of control situation. So let's go back to you, because I left you at 23,000 feet. Hopefully no one's had an anxiety attack in the meantime. But I want to talk to you about what's going on. So I left you at 23,000 feet, you're unconscious, and you're probably all sitting there wondering, well, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? The answer is very simple, nothing, nothing at all. Because your aircraft is equipped with emergency descent mode. So let's talk about how that works, but before we do, let's back up to those critical moments before you lost consciousness. Remember, I mentioned to you that you reached out to air traffic control, but in fact, you didn't. You see, hypoxia is incredibly insidious, and unless you're familiar with your symptoms, you might completely miss that you're actually developing a hypoxia situation. So you miss those cues, and then you realize it, and then it's too late. So in this instance, you never reached out to air traffic control, and even worse, you never reached over for the oxygen mask that was in the seat just next to you, that was there just in case of an emergency. And for future reference, oxygen mask always first, then air traffic control. But you didn't do any of them. You just, unfortunately, the situation got ahead of you. But the great thing is that this aircraft was watching you, and it was monitoring you, and at some point, as the situation was unfolding, you stopped engaging with the avionics. You didn't key a mic, you didn't tune a radio, you didn't push any buttons, and so the system got suspicious, and it started a timer. And after five minutes, you got a little notice down here at the bottom that says, are you alert? And you didn't acknowledge it, because after all, you were losing consciousness. So one minute later, you got another warning that says, hypoxia alert. Again. If you had not been having an issue, you would have just pushed the button and acknowledged it. But you didn't. So one minute later, the aircraft initiated an emergency descent. Initially, the aircraft launches a descent to 14,100 feet. And at that point, hopefully you'll regain consciousness. In this instance, you start down. You can see airspeed starting to pick up, altitude starting to drop and the nose is in a nose down attitude. So you're, you're descending to 14,100 feet at a relatively rapid pace. Once you arrive there, in this instance, you start to regain consciousness. You're starting to become aware of what's going on, but just a little confused. So the aircraft further descends to 12,500 feet, at which time you regain complete awareness and you're able to reach out to air traffic control, declare an emergency, and land your aircraft. And the most important thing to remember is that your entire family walks away safe and sound. So why is this important? Well, the thing to remember that each one of these safety features is a stepping stone to a lot more advancements and enhancements. A lot of them work off of each other. Additionally, we are ultimately laying the groundwork for incredibly significant safety technology coming in the very near future. And that's why you see a lot of these features coming out in bits and pieces. But I think the most amazing thing that I realized through this whole process of putting these features in our aircraft is that this is a wonderful example of the success that comes when companies work together across an in industry towards a collective goal. You see, this started with an avionics manufacturer and developer, Garmin. But it took the aircraft manufacturers being open to new ideas, willing to change, and most importantly, being willing to put safety ahead of the bottom line. And I think we can all agree that we executed this beautifully and have truly changed the lives of our customers. So the next time you travel, whether it be in the airlines or it be in a general aviation aircraft, I hope that you'll do so with the added peace of mind of knowing that there's an entire industry that is completely dedicated to 
continuously improving their products and enhancing safety. But more importantly, there's a team of people with an unwavering commitment to protecting you and your most precious cargo. And with that, I wish you blue skies and tailwinds. Thank you.